Good morning, everybody. It's nice to see you in a nice number here. My name is Marko Gadosic, and I, was the, I am the former president of IG Europe, and will be this morning the moderator of the two panels that we will be having here. Um, first of all, I would like to thank here the prominent speakers with me at the table, and uh, I will also have to excuse uh, two members of the European Parliament who will not be here with us, but we will have the very kind replacement. Um, as you know, we have gathered here to discuss about the possibilities of the co-management uh, of uh, the youth inside the European institutions. We have so far seen very nice examples in Europe happening, so the question was, is there any possibility for the co-management to actually happen on a bit higher level? Is there a possibility for the co-management to exist also within the European, uh, the European Union institutions? Um, youth is, a, is at the moment a very marginalized group of European citizens. It is a group that is facing a lot of problems, starting with the always mentioned youth unemployment, and uh, with the not real uh, ex existence and presence of youth uh, in the political uh, and the, the democratic processes. As we are facing closer to the European Parliament election, this is also one of the reasons why we, we wanted to see where exactly are we placing youth here in Europe. Um, we will start today's um, uh, this panel with uh, a very good example uh, of the Council of Europe's uh, co-management system which is existing and which has been proven to work very well. We will hear from uh, Mr. André Jacques Dodin, uh, who is the head of the governmental department of the, uh, of the department of the Council of Europe. How has it started? What has happened so far? How does it work? And can we learn from this example as the example of the best practice? Thank you. Good morning. So yes, I'm working in the Council of Europe and in charge of uh, youth policy. Uh, if I want to cooperate because I work with the government. Now uh, I only have five minutes. Uh, right on my paper, so I have to try to be very quick. I'm not going to be too fast. I'll try to be as fast as possible. Uh, Co-management in the Council of Europe is something which goes back to the 60s, early 60s. And uh, at the initiative of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, not the European Parliament, the Parliamentary Assembly, which, are made up, which is made of the parliamentarians from different countries. Uh, as a matter of fact, in 1963, the Council of Europe established a first European youth center on a sort of experimental basis. That means without any premises, no building, just uh, youth NGO meetings, seminars, and training courses. And uh, this, you, this program for the European Youth Centre Experimental was steered by a governmental committee in charge of culture, youth, education, sport in the Council of Europe. But this committee, this governmental committee, established a kind of consultative body made of governments and youth NGOs, but only with a, a consultative role. That is to say, to assist this governmental committee to draw the program of this experimental youth center. Now, the, mo the most important or the, the, the key date for Common Management in Council of Europe is 1968. I don't think any of you were born at that time. I was. 68 was the, uh, you learned in your history books, I suppose, was the uh, famous uh, crisis in several European countries uh, where people were. Uh, protesting against uh, the values of society, and young people in particular were very much protesting against authority. And uh, again, youth, uh, uh, parliamentarians and politicians were very concerned about this movement, and uh, were even scared of this uh, movement of protest. And this is why in 1968, again, the Assembly of the Council of Europe adopted a resolution uh, to uh, and recommend, recommend to uh, within the Council of Europe to increase the dialogue between young people, youth organizations, parliamentarians, and governments within the existing experimental youth center. Now, very quickly, another key date is 1972, because 1972 was the date of the creation of the permanent structures, youth structures of the Council of Europe. 
a European Youth Center with a building, which still exists in Strasbourg, and a European Youth Foundation with a proper co-management system by which a governing board made of half government, half youth organizations was in charge of drawing up the annual program of the European Youth Center and the European Youth Foundation, and then an advisory committee of youth NGO to advise this governing board. Another date, that will be very quick again, 1998, that's another key date, because 1998, there was a reform of these co-management structures. As I told you a few seconds ago, this co-management was mainly operating at the level of program. Not so much for this. Now this reform of 1998 decided to have new structures with a much more political, political role. And that's why a body called the Joint Council on Youth was established which comprises government positive from all the members of the Council of Europe plus the youth and body. And this joint council is now, because it still exists, is now the central political body of the Council of Europe uh, youth field. And it has the task no longer to look into the program of activities, but to look at policy. And it has the possibility through official channels to express and to uh, opinions about any kind of youth policy matter in the Council of Europe, and it has the task of establishing the policy of the Council of Europe in the youth field. Okay? Then the programming tasks are left to another committee, which is called the Programming Committee, which has to operate under the instructions of the Joint Council. But we still have the yes, Youth NGO uh, Committee, Maria will talk about it later, which has also a reinforced political role because it has all the possibility to address the Committee of Ministers, which is the highest body of the Council of Europe, the financial assemblies of the general on any youth matters. At the same time, the governmental committee, which is because they still a governmental committee, uh, is also uh, given the role of uh, addressing uh, policy uh, item. Final date, and I will stop there, uh, two years ago, actually, 19, uh, 2011, the Council of Europe decided to undertake a reform, a reform of the whole Council of Europe. Not of the youth structure, but I would like to say that this reform, in my opinion, and maybe you can discuss that, had some effect on the management of the Council of Europe. In the sense that the role of the Committee of Ministers, the body of the Council of Europe, uh, in my opinion, left a more narrow space for the, for the co management, in the sense that the Committee of Ministers is deciding uh, in more details the policy and the program of the Council of Europe, which means that implicitly the co-management, the, the, the space of maneuver of the co-management in the youth field, in my opinion, is now reduced. And uh, I think that that's a concern which should be addressed by youth organizations in the Council of Europe. I will stop now for the moment. Uh, I might have a bit more things to say, but I think it's better to wait until questions. So well, thank you very much. I hope it's not too short, uh, but uh, again, uh, I think we have a possibility to discuss it. Thank you. Thank you very much for this. Indeed, it's interesting to see how far in history the home management system goes. And also, I am sure that you all share your scare of how it is happening nowadays, and this is why we actually started also with you and how it goes this very important. Uh, I think we'll hear now from more practical side how it actually works. Here with us we have Maria Vasco. She is the chair uh, of, uh, of the Advisory Council on Youth of the Council of Europe. Uh, she, you are there only for a year and a half now, almost two years working there. And we are very interested to, to hear how it, how it really works from a more practical side and what actually youth can say in the structures of the Council. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be among you today. Actually, I'm here in two months, even though my Monday finishes uh, in six months. Uh, we are the first Monday after the reforms that uh, we, the last reforms that we have as a, a PESAC set. The mandate of the advisory council is now it used to be three years, and now it's two years. So the advisory council, as um, you might understood, it's the non-governmental partner in the youth department and in the Council of Europe. And we have representatives of 30 organizations. 20 of them are coming through elections of the youth 
from the European Forum and then are selected by the Secretary General and the Youth Department, approved by the Secretary General of the Council of Europe. And the final um, um, decision is made by the Committee of Ministers. The role of uh, the Advisory Council is not limited only to our case in the, in the different bodies. Do you not hear me? I see some movements in the office and I'm like, okay. Um, so I was saying that the, advisory, the, the role of the advisory council is not only limited in uh, consulting. Uh, we co-decide together with the governmental representatives the programs of the Council of Europe, of the Youth Department, the political orientation, the work priorities, and uh, all um, decisions that are related with the work that we are doing in the Youth Department. Um, so, what is very important in this co-management system is that the representation is equal and the decisions are taken in consensus, which is challenging sometimes, we have to say, but uh, this is the way that we move forward. Um, it is, uh, as uh, Advezak said, uh, the Council of Europe recognized the role of the youth organizations years ago. And in my point of view, with this, manage the oldest institution in Europe to be up to date with the youth policies. Uh, it gives actually the opportunity to the youth representatives not only participating in the, in the, in the, in the youth department. We are advocates, as Adresse accept, and I will repeat it, in all different bodies of the Council of Europe. We have a co close cooperation with the parliamentary assembly. We have a close cooperation with the Congress of local and regional authorities. We can ask and have um, uh, discussions with the committee of ministers. We have a close cooperation with the Commission on Human Rights. And, all, and in all these examples, we are discussing with them what is the opinions and the concerns of young people. Um, what is also very interesting is that all um, uh, decisions and actually even results of youth events or other actions that we are organizing, we are organizing as a youth department, are taken up to the high institution of the Council of Europe, where they don't stay in the drawers. Uh, I can give you a very concrete example on that. Last year we had a youth event right to the ministerial conference uh, um, on the, uh, the minister responsible for youth in St. Petersburg. The results of this event were uh, taken up by the Parliamentary Assembly, the relevant committee of the Parliamentary Assembly, and we are, they came with a recommendation based on the youth event results. So this recommendation now goes to the committee of ministers. So what I want to say is that the, the proposals coming from young people are taken up and they are becoming recommendations. Um, closing my intervention, I would like to say that what is also very interesting in this process of the co-management system of the Council of Europe, it's uh, the, the uh, um, first, it's the perspective that young people have for politics and how this can change. Uh, for me, this is a win-win approach. First, the Council of Europe has the young people inside and they directly the opinion from young people that they, they, they are working in the grassroots with others and they represent the opinion of all the Europeans. And at the same time, um, you know, we change our opinion about politics in the means that we, our, our opinion is taken into account and um, our proposals are taken on board and uh, we, we feel in a way that we can trust again politics. It's not an easy way, as I said, it's very challenging. The competencies that you gain through the processes and some of them are very challenging, are really viable. But uh, I think that these are uh, elements that uh, all institutions, not only Europeans, worldwide might, should think when they, they open discussion on how we can improve the cooperation and how we can bring the opinion of young people in the institutions. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. I will just quote the last sentence you said because it is very interesting to hear you saying we can trust them politics. 
I think that this really is the core point of everything, especially hearing from you, or even the position of a channel before your experience in the Hellenic National Council. This will be interesting to see and inspiring to see how, how the whole process actually changes the, the perception of, uh, of young people. Um, we have heard a great example from the Council of Europe, how it actually works, and uh, that it has its benefits. We will move now a bit closer to Brussels, and we will go to the European institutions, starting with the European Parliament. We have with us Mr. Lucas Gabriello, uh, who is the secretary of the Youth Intergroup of the European Parliament. Luca, please tell us a bit more what yes. the Parliament is in this. Clearly, uh, first of all, uh, I have the duty to bring you the apologies from uh, Aydar Gardiazabal, which is the chair of the intergroup that was supposed to be here tomorrow at Iliasse, but unfortunately this morning she got sick, so she's not even here in the house. And uh, she asked me a bit uh, to bring you a bit uh, the point of view of the, of the European Parliament on a discussion that, of course, especially on the year of, uh, of active citizenship uh, is uh, extremely important also for us uh, in European uh, Parliament. For those who are not familiar on what is the European, the European Parliament Youth Intergroup uh, is uh, a network of more of 40 members of the European Parliament which uh, on a regular basis are exchanging, are cooperating on a, with a, a clear aim, strengthen the youth policy and the youth in the agenda of the European Parliament. Things, uh, and also make sure that there is a coherency on what we are doing here in the House and that what we are doing here in the House can also bring vis-à-vis -vis the other institutions, but also by bridging with the civil society organization, also can make the difference also in the everyday life of young people. A mission that is getting more and more difficult, especially in 2013, you know that we are in the sixth year of, the, of crisis, and uh, of course, this is not only an economic crisis, but it's a crisis also that is involving more and more uh, also political processes, and this also influencing the participation of young people. We have seen also in the results of uh, <coughs> the last uh, elections. And uh, it's fundamental for Europe to start by rebuilding uh, its relations with the citizenship. We are convinced of one thing, so we will not have any credible way out from the crisis without rebuilding new ways of participation. There is no way out from the crisis if we don't start from here to rebuilding with civil society, with young, with young people, with citizens, a new citizenship act. And, uh, and this is for us fundamental also the relations with the uh, youth civil society, with youth organization, because uh, we consider uh, of this process uh, the civil society a key point, and also the support for civil society. As you know, we have been working throughout, and we have been fighting throughout the discussion regarding the Erasmus for All, to make sure that youth organizations are not only recognized as a project factory, just to be rough with you, but uh, to be recognized uh, as uh, fundamental partners uh, by not only the European Commission, by the whole of the European Union, as uh, a fundamental actor in uh, the dialogue at European level concerning young people. And uh, also by giving the new recognition to the role of what we have also at the European level, to try to strengthen and enhance what we have, which is the European structure dialogue. We are also in the European Parliament now uh, we have this process that is also, let's say, is also the result of years of claiming. I remember, just to give you an historical data, I'm not here new, but uh, I remember uh, a young person in 2004 basically uh, making uh, to the, at that time, uh, the director for youth policies uh, uh, a question, will we have at the European level, at the European Union, Management, and it was 2005 when, we did, uh, when I did this question uh, to the European Commission. And I think also that uh, in those years, uh, basically, the, um, the co-management has been also for us uh, the ideal horizon to ask and uh, to challenge uh, the institutions, uh, the youth organization ourselves, and also the member states on how we can include young people, how we can include youth organization. 
because it's clear that if participation is conceived only as in the moment when you are casting your ballot paper, it's clear that we are missing the fundamental point of also how we are building all the European institutions, why we are also working at this level. To say one thing that is very clear, nothing for us without us. And uh, I think that this is also the sense of why uh, youth organization, but also let's say within the institution, we are working for this uh, involvement. Uh, about the structured dialogue, we are at the moment assessing in the house the strategy and also deciding the team, or proposing the team for the next uh, uh, for the next cycle. One thing is clear, and I think also should be the starting point while discussing also further uh, further. Uh, progress in the way how we are involving young people. The first one is that we need to reach more young people, more youth organization. But also we have to be clear on the fact that the system has to deliver more, has to be implemented more, has to be more consistent in the, constant, in the contents they are delivering, and all this will be in the report that the European Parliament is drafting. Because any strategy that is aiming at involving young people has not only the duty to involve them, but has also the duty to implement what they are deciding. And I think this is what we are lacking at the moment. And also, let me say, also to see a bit critically from the perspective of the Council of Europe, as uh, I had also a bit of experience, and we are also as intergroup uh, trying to cooperate uh, more and more with the, as the European Parliament, also with the parliamentary assembly and so on is also with the challenge for the structure, the, for the management system, trying not only to build a system that is involving young people, but a system that every day is impacting the decision of an institution, like the European Union, that is every day struggling between an intergovernmental system and also, let me say, a more federal system where there are uh, federal institutions like Europe. And I think, therefore, we have uh, three challenges uh, that we see clearly in front of us. The first one is uh, we need to increase uh, also, uh, while talking about uh, management, we have also to think that today the competencies of the European Union when it comes to youth policies are limited. And this is a limit not only for the youth organization, this has been a, a limit for the European Parliament uh, where, let's say, it should be in the common management system, let's say, should be considered, let's say, one of the main uh, questions. So, first of all, it's a problem of competences. We don't have at the European level nothing more than a coordination system, the open method coordination, and what we call the youth strategy, is not enough anymore, especially in times of crisis. And second, also, there is a challenge also for, uh, for us, uh, for us, I don't have to tell this, for the youth organization, we think in the sense that uh, we don't have uh, to, uh, you don't have also to, uh, you have also to find a way also to, how can I say, sail in open seas, uh, knowing that in the European Parliament we are working for the same thing as you are, which is to increase the space for participation. And, uh, and therefore we have always to engage uh, with this dialogue, uh, that uh, is not only taking place in the framework of what we have, which is the structural dialogue, but it has to go also in the processes, in the main political processes. Sometimes we manage to have this partnership, sometimes we have to improve on this, uh, but this is the aim, and I'm sure that in future we will manage to improve on this. Thanks. Thank you, Luca, very much, um, especially from the point of view in the group. It's interesting to hear this. Um, we will now proceed to the maybe even stronger institution here, if I may be a bit politically incorrect, to the European Commission. Uh, here with me at the table we have Mr. Pascal Lejean, coming from the youth unit, he's the head of the youth unit of the European Commission. Mr. Lejean, what you are doing for youth is very, very much appreciated. Uh, all the things you have been doing in your unit, um, especially the funding that we always are very much in need of. Um, what do you think about this topic? Do you think that co management is something that could happen, that could exist? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me and for this uh, interesting topic, which has a very strong uh, legal dimension. Uh, 
and an institutional one, which I'm not a specialist. <laughs> That's why I'm going to give you some personal views on what the involvement of new stakeholders in policy making may mean, because at the end of the day, it is what co-management uh, aims at. Uh, first of all, let's underline that uh, participation of young people is one of the main objectives of the EU new strategy. So it is evident for the EU institutions that we have to practice what we preach, and that this principle of participation should also be taken into account in the relationships that we have with the uh, representative bodies of young people. What may co-management mean? Maybe there is a need for a definition of what it could mean, or better say, of what it could mean in our spatial institutional setting. Uh, in a flyer from the Council of Europe, and I just uh, confirmation of this, of course, by the um, intervention of the Buddha, uh, this institution claims to be the only organization worldwide putting young people on an equal footing with governments in the decision making on youth issues. This suggests that it works in a very extensive manner with young people, and uh, this also uh, suggests to make a, a check of compatibility with uh, the, um, of this approach with the institutional rules of the European Union, basically the, the treaty itself. Uh, the co management of the Council of Europe includes, we have seen it, decision in policy as well as in programs, uh, with the joint Council of Youth being a co decision body in charge of establishing, I quote, the youth sector's priorities, objectives, budget and also the Programming Committee on Youth, establishing, monitoring, evaluating the programs of the youth centers and of the youth foundation, I mean something which may be seen as a sort of program, uh, uh, spending program, uh, if we try to make a present with what we have uh, at your in the in the So, I see many differences between the organization of the Council of Europe system and the organization of the EU system. Uh, and we have to question how would a co-management system, including these processes just described, fit according, uh, according to the current rules of the treaty uh, with, uh, uh, for example, the following uh, uh, realities, which are that the Parliament and the Council are the co-legislative bodies in the European Union, which are that the European Commission has the monopoly of the right of initiative under the current rules of the uh, treaty. If even we refer to a limited uh, aspect of the issue, namely program management, here again, we have the treaty, which for the time being uh, ensures that uh, there must be what we call comitology, so a specific approach uh, to associate representatives of the member states, uh, while ensuring the right of scrutiny of the parliament uh, in the implementation uh, by the commission. Maybe the commission has the, uh, is the executive body, but it has to accompany its decisions when it comes to uh, the implementation of a uh, program by uh, comitology, so involvement of the member states, representatives, and also the right of scrutiny of the parliament. <coughs> In this, the treaty currently does not foresee the involvement of civil society. Now, could we, but because of what I've just said, seeking out of the box, out of the current frame, uh, consider that such uh, involvement in the future may be a good evolution. Uh, maybe you can discuss this. Uh, but uh, immediately some questions arise uh, regarding, for example, the responsibility, which goes with the executive power. Uh, currently, the Commission is ultimately responsible vis-à-vis -vis the legislative body regarding
regarding the implementation of the EU financial instruments. That leads with its sole responsibility of executive power. Uh, in other words, uh, just to, to, to help uh, reflect on the consequences, are, are we um, uh, talking exactly the same thing when it comes to at least this part of the activities of the Council of Europe and of the European Union? We are comparing billions on one hand and, and some billions on the other. Just to limit to this part, which is program management, I understand why there are other issues, but just to, to, to highlight some elements. What about the risk of conflicts of interest? Here again, uh, in the uh, European uh, setting, the European Union, I mean, uh, we support, and, and beyond the news uh, sector, to the best of my knowledge, also in other sectors, we support with our financial instruments some natural and obvious interlocutors also in the decision, um, uh, I would not say making, but <laughs> involvement, let's say, to, to use a loose word. Uh, of course, the use perform, but also the use NGOs. So uh, I'm not saying that this would a priori prohibit any uh, stronger involvement of the use of representatives what we do, or of the environmental uh, lobbyists in what the environment does, uh, but it does at least to be a uh, about, which means that at least on this aspect, I think that the comparison with the Council of Europe, which is, as they say, the unique, uh, um, inspiring uh, um, uh, example for the time being, uh, finds uh, some limits uh, quite rapidly. But it would be very interesting to know what constitutionalists uh, may think of this. Um, and as I already introduced, uh, how would this may, because it would need a change of the fundamental of the basic rules of uh, how the European Union works, uh, uh, how this may also be applied in other sectors than the new sector. Uh, just to nevertheless to stay on this level and give some additional uh, views in case you have not uh, had them uh, already. Uh, we try to be as pragmatic as we can in the context of the current uh, uh, setting. And for example, uh, the youth forum is invited as uh, uh, observator uh, in the uh, selections which are made at the European level for the selection of projects uh, by the executive agency. We ask the representatives of uh, youth to be part of the selection committees, also at national levels, for all the networks of national agencies. So this is not co-management in rule. This is a kind of pragmatic approach on certain issues, as far as we can, to involve uh, youth representatives in uh, uh, our management, even a program which is a tough issue, uh, and the same goes for the evaluation. Of the, the programs that we have. Does it mean that the EU system does not take into account the opinion of stakeholders? Again, the Commission and the other institutions are conscious of the importance of involving the stakeholders in shaping legislation. And this is not only for use, this is valid for all our sectors. And now we have, since the adoption the ratification of the Lisbon Treaty, clear obligation to so we have introduced with the Lisbon Treaty, which, uh, with its Article 11, a uh, notion of particip participatory democracy, which was a little bit, I would say, French bricolé in the past. Uh, since uh, in the years 2000, there was a kind of code of good conduct, if I remember well, based on the white paper of the Commission uh, on good governance, suggesting that the stakeholders be consulted uh, in the um, uh, design of policies uh, which concern them, but now it has become something much more stronger, <coughs> which is binding. To just uh, mention one uh, example, no piece of legislation can go out of the Commission if there is not been for an impact assessment process to get the, uh, the views uh, of the stakeholders concerned. I'm conscious of the fact that by saying this, I'm referring to consultation. 
I'm not referring to uh, co-management, but I think that this is nevertheless something which also deserves to be taken uh, into um, account. And maybe this leads to also a sort of philosophic uh, or at least political question for the youth organizations. Where is the, uh, how to say, the way that it influenced the curriculum? In co-managing something or in getting a certain independence which goes with the right to be consulted and after that the right to react, to lobby. Uh, I don't know. Uh, a reference was made to uh, Erasmus for All. Yes, of course, the Council of Europe, the, sorry, the, 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 there was local management of the proposal established by the Commission. I can only come to the conclusion that that was that, uh, uh, you uh, and other news organizations that not de facto play the role in what Erasmus Hall will look like at the end of the process. But this is a, a reflection for the youth sector rather than the need for, for me speaking uh, from uh, an institutional point. But what I've said so far may relate particularly to strong legislation. I mentioned, for example, the grants, which are published. Oh, we are talking about what is regulation, so the highest level in the law order of the European Union. And this is the bulk of uh, the lawmaking of the EU system. But in the youth sector and some others, uh, since the beginning of uh, the, the years 2000, we have developed another approach, which is softer, which is what we call the open method of coordination. And when it comes to what we do under the, the regime of the open method of coordination uh, in the youth sector, and this is specific to the youth sector, we have developed sort of sui generis mode of involvement of the stakeholders which is unique. I'm not aware of another process taking place on my hands, which is, of course, obviously compatible with the treaty, and which is far reaching if it is correctly implemented. I refer, of course, to the structured dialogue, which is a tool of the um, use of a method of coordination. To be noted that this has been introduced uh, following a process of consultation, which as such was a, 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 an involvement of, of, of young people. The Commission did not propose what was called the uh, EU uh, youth strategy and uh, investing and empowering without having made what we call a tour de capital, whereby we consulted the ministry, all of them, in all of the states, the ministries, our national agencies, because they are strongly involved in what we do in the youth sector, of national agency of the youth in action program, and the uh, national youth councils. So even at the origin of the uh, strategy which promotes uh, participation, we had a participation uh, process uh, in 2009. Uh, you may know the, the, the main characteristics of the structured dialogue, I just uh, very quickly mentioned some elements which I think are relevant for this debate. It is a youth-led process. The youth forum chairs the steering group of the structured dialogue. It holds the secretariat of the structured dialogue. This process is financially supported. It fits the con council conclusions with recommendation from youth conferences which the other representatives, urban people and representatives of ministries. I'm not sure we are that far on some um, uh, structures uh, existing in the Council of Europe. And I must also say that the youth law, for example, was associated in the reporting on the implementation of the strategy. So even the way the Commission uh, and the Council, because it's a joint report, are accountable on how the strategy, on, the, on how the open method of coordination is implemented, as 
associate uh, the representative of the young people. I'm not suggesting that this system may not be improved. First of all, it's young, three years old. It is under review, as you may know. And one of the elements which may be seen as something of particular relevance when it comes to trying to draw this towards a more involving uh, tool uh, is the, the way the priorities of the strategy <coughs> are fixed. And it's true that maybe so far uh, the uh, participation of young people through the structured dialogue was mainly on topics which had been decided not with the young people, but this based on the resolution of the council uh, last November is supposed to evolve also and maybe uh, a way to introduce this participation process even at the, at the level of fixing the priorities. So my uh, conclusion is rather to find not to underestimate uh, what we do today, which again is what we can do because of the limitation of the treaty, a co-management, if it were to be something uh, as far uh, as I can guess from uh, Mr. Bodden's uh, presentation, uh, from what I know from the Council of Europe, uh, would uh, have uh, institutional implications. Last comment. The, uh, and, uh, and here again, suggests the difference, surely, the uh, structured dialogue, as we understand it, is not an EU post parliament, it's an EU process, obviously, but not limited to the EU level, but has to be implemented also at national and local level. So, if we want to give a certain consistency in the way we work with young people, uh, are we going for uh, trying to have co management at national level? At local level, maybe at local level it is easier, maybe it is only done some, at certain places, I, 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 I don't know. Uh, but again, here we have a comprehensive approach when it comes to structured dialogue. Uh, could a, um, a co management system be <laughs> as comprehensive? I don't know. Uh, and final uh, remark uh, obviously, this would not concern only the youth sector, but would surely uh, also uh, involve other sectors because a change in the treaty would have a, mark, a, a much more far reaching uh, uh, consequence. Thank you. Ms. Lajot, thank you very much for this very deep input and for the perspective on the co management from the Commission side. Uh, also for bringing up the topic of, of the structure dialogue. I think what we will be most grateful for are the questions you have raised before regarding the responsibility and possible risks. It will bring because it will especially boost the discussion we will have this afternoon in the working group so that all the possible sides are being discussed and brought into, into the topic in the room. Um, for the last but not the least, we will have the President of the European Youth Forum already in his second mandate, probably the biggest, strongest advocate in the world for youth rights. Um, with that, uh, we have heard a lot of a lot of different perspectives here at this panel this morning. So, what does the European Youth Forum think? What do you think about it? Especially because this has already been on the agenda of the Youth Forum. Uh, can we leave the room with smiles on our faces, or should we wait for a while? Good morning, everyone. Um, first and foremost, the Youth Forum, as such, is the biggest defender of youth rights, and we are just instruments uh, on behalf of uh, the people that we represent. So it's not me personally, but it's the entire platform that does that work with all the people like Luca and others in the past who have done that work. So I need to clarify that, even though it's latter. Thank you very much. Um, we can always smile because there's always a cause to smile. A smile on our faces is better than, than grumpy faces because uh, um, we have achieved a lot already uh, in the youth field. 
in different elements. But a lot has been said, so I'll try to pick up only on, on some specific points um, that are very interesting. First and foremost, from the reform perspective, we need to see co-management from two sides. The legal aspect that was mentioned by Pascal is very relevant from both cases in the Council of Europe practice and in the EU. And also on the cultural level. Why cultural level? Because we need to talk about the culture of participation. This is a way of young people participating and being represented in decision making and policy making. And, and there I would like to remind you of most of you are familiar with the ladder that was proposed by Hart the academic of the different eight levels of participation. Of course, what we aspire to is the last one, rung eight, which says, uh, you know, young people and adults sharing decision making. We don't want to be just consulted. And if I would be provocative and very simplistic, I could say that we are at letter five when it comes to structured dialogue, being consult young people being consulted and informed. Uh, and we are at ladder eight in the Council of Europe where we have the co-management. But that would be a simplistic way of putting it because there's a lot of gray in there. We heard from André Jacques that even in the ideal case of the Council of Europe, we are encountering challenges that we are, uh, have been facing. Uh, and Maria has mentioned uh, those things. So it's not only a pretty picture within the Council of Europe. And it's true that the Committee of Ministers has taken on more role and has taken a bit away from us, and we, we are there to counter that balance uh, to achieve, to pertain what we have achieved in the past. So, you know, even in, in paradise, sometimes there are, there are problems, and we need, to, we need to fight that. On the other hand, in the structural dialogue, as we heard from, uh, from Pascal, not everything is as, as bad, and actually, we are almost at level seven when, because we, as young people's representative, are taking the lead and initiating action when it comes to the structural dialogue. So the, the challenge that we are facing is uniform because we are in both processes that we have an ideal that we aspire to and we want to preserve and continue implementing, which is the co-management as we understand. The co-management uh, as most commonly put, a common responsibility for implementation of policies that are created jointly. And that's something we do in both cases, within the structured dialogue as a tool and within the existing co-management in the Council of Europe. But when it comes to the co-management as a cooperation between government and young people that are equally represented and have equal shares of power, that's not the case in the structure that. <coughs> it is the case at EU level, and this is the schizophrenic situation, because within the European Steering Committee and what we do within the structure dialogue at EU level, we actually, to a certain extent, have that in the sense that the EU Forum uh, but also the National Youth Councils of the trio presidencies, so of the countries that are holding the presidency or within the team presidency, they are also represented there and they initiate things and then take action. So it's a very merged system and it has brought a lot of good results. But, of course, we need to understand that definition is key here. Every time we talk to the Commission and to the EU officials, uh, especially in the Council of the EU, about co-management. They understand something completely different. Co-management for them is co-managing financial matters only, mostly. Uh, that's at least been the response that we were given. And of course we say yes, but that's part of what we want, because that's part of what we have in the Council of Europe with the Program Committee, that is the committee that was mentioned by André Jacques, that deals with, with the program of the European Youth Foundation. And uh, as Pascal mentioned, an important question of the conflict of interest. I personally don't see any conflict of interest because we have experience over uh, decades in the program committee where young people and youth representatives co-decide and manage the funds. Um, and it could be seen by some saying, yeah, but you know, there are people sitting and representing one organization that gets the funds. It's a, again, a very simplistic way of putting it. It could be a, a critique. But if you look at the proceedings and the way the program committee functions, they are ensuring that these conflicts of interest are avoided. So uh, I'm, I'm very certain and confident that we avoid those things and we do things by the book as it should be. So we need to look at indeed the legal framework that we have in both cases. We need to strengthen the role of youth organizations in that uh, area. And within the Council of Europe, we have a fight to fight uh, as well as we have at the EU level. As Luca was mentioning, the Parliament is not involved in any way whatsoever uh, when it comes to the youth field at the moment. They are involved when it comes to the more broader settings, such as the negotiations on the next multi financial framework, and they've been a uh, very, very important ally and the main actor.
chapter in ensuring there will be a youth chapter within the next uh, program uh, of the EU on education, training, youth, and support, whose name is still a secret, but apparently Ms. Vasily and Ms. Park have agreed on it. Uh, so there are a lot of challenges there. We need to see, and we've been pushing as youth forum, how we can involve the European Parliament into the structure of the process at EU level, because we have not only national level, we also have the international level. This is the peculiarity and this is the responsibility of the Youth Forum to ensure that the international youth organizations are involved in the structure dialogue and the national youth councils uh, have the responsibility to a certain extent to help us in that, in opening up the structure dialogue to the internationals, the same way as the internationals were welcoming the national youth councils into the co-management system of the Council of Europe, because let's not forget, Maria is actually the first chair of the AC that is representing uh, the National Youth Councils, because there, among the 30, it's been mainly 20, uh, it's been mainly the big majority of internationals. So there are responsibilities from our side uh, on that. But I really like what Pascal mentioned in terms of a potential midway solution at which we are aspiring at the moment. It's this schizophrenic situation in which we are living within the EU and structured dialogue and then the Council of Europe that we have, if we look at the local level, the national level, the member states, because in both institutions it's the member states that still have the power because this is the field of youth, this is the possibly the lowest, uh, um, nearest to the decision making at national level, in Germany it's at regional level for example. So we really need to focus on the national level and there the national level is mainly when it comes to youth policy looking to the Council of Europe in terms of how they build up their youth sector, how they build up their youth policy. They do look to the EU, yes, in terms of the EU strategy and all the other things, but for 40 years the youth policy has been mainly the domain of the Council of Europe and the member states of the Council of Europe have been looking at at that, and it's been the Council of Europe that's been pushing, and us as Youth Forum and our predecessors pushing, we need to have national youth councils at national level uh, to involve in the decision making. So I think when it comes to the structured dialogue, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to target the national level to ensure that the national working groups would mirror to the biggest extent possible the co-management as we know it in the Council of Europe. We have a, a good precedent, we have the Lithuanian case, uh, that is also similar to the Council of Europe facing challenges, but still on paper it's an ideal case where uh, youth organizations, active youth organizations, uh, especially the DOT as a National Youth Council, are actually doing the co-management of youth affairs. They are invited to every committee that is tackling a youth issue, not just the youth committee directly, but also others. Um, so we are hoping that now with the Lithuanian presidency coming up, we will be able to build on that good example and in, embed this into the review of the structured dialogue that is coming up. So I think for an interim period, that's our best chance of, of really pushing things. And I appreciate what Scott is saying, and it has been a challenge for us that actually we have seen, even though structured dialogue hasn't been on paper what we wanted, uh, we have come a long way in, in practice. And, and that's the important thing as well. Uh, we will not go away from our ideals, of course, but we will always try to fight step by step uh, to achieve the most. So there is a smile that we should carry uh, and, and continue to push to the maximum that we can. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, for the very encouraging speech and for the smile that we have. Um, this has been it from this part of the room. We will now go to you here, and uh, since we have a short of time, we will try to be very fast. So uh, let's make a round of questions. Um, I will first take three of them, and then we will reply. Please uh, name yourself and where you're coming from, and also, if possible, target your question to one of the panelists here at the table. Uh, hello, I'm Swana from Jeff Europe. Um, I have a question to Anneli Jacques Dauden. Um, if the reforms in 2011 has left less space for co-management with the youth, then why did these reforms take place? Question? Mika? Yeah, my question 
use for Pascal and also for Andrew Jack because we are talking about uh, youth issues and the youth uh, matters. But maybe one way of uh, enhancing the participation of youth is inc increasing what are the, the matters that youth is involved in. Because I think that it's one of the key, key uh, ways of increasing participation of young people to make them able to participate in more issues, not only in the most strictly based and related with uh, young people, but also things that, like environment or uh, urban design can also be open for your participation of young people, and I would like to hear your opinion on that. And the last question. Hello, I'm Alexia from the European Civil Society platform and Life and Learning. And I just uh, would like to ask Mr. Lejean how is his co-management in the future program, because indeed it has been a bit developed for the program committee, and as far as I know, and if I'm not mistaken, only social partners will now be involved in the future program committee. And I was wondering if you see it as a setback from, from the Life and Learning program, and how do you see the involvement of civil society in the next program committee as for use, as for education and training, etc. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Uh, we can start with Mr. Donal. Uh, there was a question about the first the reforms to the level and then Okay, thank you very much. Now before we continue your 2011, first of all you have to uh, bear in mind that uh, the reasons for this reform is that the Council of Europe and still today is undergoing some kind of uh, uncertainty and security because uh, of the development within the European Union. Uh, many governments are asking today what is the role of the Council of Europe in the uh, overall uh, European construction. Uh, the Council of Europe uh, initially was uh, set up to uh, <coughs> Of Europe, 
Uh, let's not be too naive. Uh, the co-management, uh, as elaborated it is, it's still under the control of the member states. The Joint Council on Youth, for example, the Joint Council on Youth, if this Joint Council on Youth does not succeed or fails to find a consensus, it's up to the committee to decide. So there is still the control of the committee ministers. And so let's not imagine that co-management is totally free to act as they want. There is still, still a political and budgetary framework which is imposed by member states. So that's very important. Uh, the second question, uh, yeah, this is very important. And uh, this is why the, the question of uh, the mainstreaming of youth uh, matters within the Council of Europe. This is very important. The Council of Ministers insist very, very much that all other sets of the Council of Europe takes into account the, the opinions of young people through our youth department. So we have uh, different channels, different possibilities in order to somehow oblige all other sectors to, uh, to listen to us, to listen to young people. And again, coming back to culture, co-management is very much a question of culture because in the Council of Europe, it's, the, it's I mean, if, if the Joint Council is able to do what it does, and if, if other sectors of the Council of Europe are listening to young people, it's because there is a trust this has always been a trust. The Committee of Ministers so far has always fully trusted the co-management structures. Because if you only, only look at the legal aspect, you may say that co-management is the basis because the Committee of Ministers uh, uh, is a supreme body which decides. But in practice, there is a complete trust. And when I say that uh, these things are kind of a bit, I'm a little bit concerned about this lack of trust. Maybe I'm wrong now, but uh, I would, I would uh, invite you, for the organizations, you, to be careful and to, uh, to continue struggling for it all in this direction. Thank you for the answer, and we will proceed to Mr. Nash. Thank you. Um, when it comes to the uh, involvement of youth in other sectors, uh, I do not see uh, the structured dialogue as being an exclusive tool for the limited definition of which we may have of, of use, uh, interest, or issues. In other words, of course, there are uh, elements in our um, new strategy, for example, which uh, refer to topics use participation, volunteering, which are very much in the remit of what we do in the youth sector. But if you take another example, for example health, which is also one of our lines of action, environment may well be one of them in the context of uh, youth in the world, the global issues, for example. I be tempted to uh, consider that a tool like the structured dialogue may apply to this. I see the structured dialogue as being something that we have developed as a tool of our strategy, but which we may offer to other sectors who would like to involve young people in the uh, uh, policy design of their own sector. Uh, to take an example, uh, it is in the context of the structured dialogue, uh, if I refer to what the people said some months uh, and I was present, uh, that uh, the uh, use reality had been uh, mentioned, uh, felt at least uh, strongly, and the same may be regarding uh, the uh, quality of internship. Huh? Uh, this is not dealt with by uh, my direct regional that we by another director. But we do not consider that uh, the structured dialogue is to get the view of young people on topics that we manage in the restricted uh, sense of what we may call the uh, uh, use policy, but, but also as, as a way to offer it to, to other sectors. When it 
comes to the management uh, of the future program, uh, I have not a, a clear answer to your question now. But I just want to say that, to the best of my knowledge, when it comes to life of learning, there are some provisions which uh, impose a consult a consult uh, consultation, uh, uh, no, exactly the, the level, huh? uh, of the social partners because of the inclusion of the vocational training uh, dimension with Leonardo in uh, uh, life of This part will be again in uh, Erasmus Hall, and I'm pretty sure that the same rules will apply, but again, to be checked. When it comes to the Secretary of the West, the, the, the current use in action program, it will be again to, to design, but I can tell you that uh, the use of is invited at all Okay, again, in a pragmatic way, because this is not the most important organization. But uh, at all our uh, uh, program committee meetings, and as a matter of fact, uh, the council. Thank you very much for this. Um, unfortunately, um, we are a bit of a lack of time, so we will proceed now with the coffee break. For all the questions you still have, uh, please uh, feel free to ask uh, the dear guests here uh, during the coffee break. Um, I would like to thank you in the name of IJ for all of you for your kind acceptance and participation for coming here. I'm sure that all of the all of the speeches and the answers to the questions will be a great boost this afternoon for the roof group which will be drafting certain recommendations on the topic. Thank you very much and enjoy the conference.